Hey there folks, Cozzy here for Pick One Pack One and welcome back to our series of Jack's Bounty on a Budget. This time we are taking on the Collector's Horde to try and grab ourselves a playset of hibernating behemoths. I'm pumped, I've got to admit, I actually think this is one of the most enjoyable um, games in the campaign. It just leads to really interesting decks. The reason why the mission rules are as follows. Cards cost two less on the turn that they are drawn. Doesn't apply to your opening hand and it only applies for the turn that they have been drawn. Ordinarily I like to try and find a diverse series of decks that attack this particular mission and I don't like to be copying what my opponent does but the Elysian style uh, draw a card deck that Curios the Collector incorporates is really quite fine for what we're doing. And so I thought rather than scratch my head at trying to play something inferior at Curios's own game, I wanted to take a moment to look at the nature of deck building. Um, because, you know, being on a budget, this is probably for people who are relatively new to CCGs like Eternal and oftentimes what people will do when playing ranked is just to grab a list off the internet and run it straight away. But the reality is if you can look at a list and start to find its core elements, you can tweak it and adjust it quite a bit to keep you happy. And so that's what I want to do with these two particular decks. They're both Elysian decks, they're both Elysian decks that try to take advantage of the cheap uh, cards on a card draw mechanic but they're doing it in slightly different ways and I hope that this will be useful for you guys. So to start off with let's take a look at this uh, Clockroach list which is a style of combo deck that's an awful lot of fun. It was something that was quite popular uh, before the open beta was released and has waxed and waned in popularity since. It's often seen as just a fun deck and it is particularly fun in this particular matchup. Uh, the key card is Clockroach. Uh, it's an unusual card, it has the ability Echo which means that when you draw it you get a duplicate copy for free and it's worth noting that that happens no matter which way you draw it. And so we're going to be trying to abuse that in this particular deck. And every time you summon it, all of the Clockroaches in your hand and deck at plus one plus one. It's a bit like your first apartment that you move into once you uh, get out of home. Once you found one uh, Cockroach or Clockroach in this case, you'll quickly find a lot and they'll become a bigger and bigger problem unless you deal with it instantly. But we're in the market for making a bigger problem. So along with a Clockroach with Echo, a Twin Brood Sauropod with Echo, a Thunderstrike Dragon with Echo, and also a Jotun Hurler with Fate, we have a whole bunch of ways of trying to manipulate this Echo mechanic and to allow it to get out of hand. The first of which is Nesting Abasaur. This allows you to put a card from your hand on top of your deck and its cost is reduced by two permanently. So if we have a Clockroach in our hand, we can choose to put one of the copies on top of our deck so when we draw it next turn, we draw an additional copy and it is also cheaper still. We can Twinning Ritual it where we ha draw a copy of a unit that's in our hand, we clone it, we also get a copy of the Echo clone, they get plus one plus one and that is permanent. So if we happen to say Twinning Ritual a Clockroach, it turns into a 3-3, three, three. we get a second copy of the 3-3. Three, three. We nesting Avasaur it on top of our deck. It gets cheaper. They're still 3-3s. Three, when we play them, they make all of them bigger. We can second side in the same way of drawing cards, then putting one on top of the deck so we get to draw it all over again. Or indeed, if they kill it, we can dark return it, and that's still drawing a unit from the void. So the draw still applies for all of these cards. We have a little bit of ramp. We have a couple of cards that take advantage of the fact that they'll be free when we draw them, such as Find the Way or Unstable Form. Temple Scribe likewise will be free and allow us to draw cards straight away and then the rest of this is all about abusing these echo mechanics and trying to make as many copies as possible as fast as possible. As far as rarity goes, we're spending four of our rare cards on Clockroaches, which I know is not everybody's cup of tea because it's really only used in the Clockroach deck and you do need to build around it. Fortunately, everything else is very reasonable indeed. The only other rare that we have in this particular list are a pair of Thunderstrike Dragons because they've been beefed up recently uh, in the new patch. And so to make things interesting, I wanted to include one card that I'm aware is a legendary, uh, but it's a card that often goes hand in hand in the Clockroach combo deck. So I'm hoping that we have a chance to see it, but it's really not essential at all, guys. The Crown of Possibilities means that when you draw a unit, it gets a random skill. And because we're trying to draw the same card so many times, it keeps getting a random skill each time so that hopefully our Clockroach will soon have Overwhelm and Quick Draw and whatever else we want so that we keep making copies of an ever-increasing 
extremely terrifying example of a cockroach. You know, we all joke about if we get to the apocalypse, the, cockro- uh, the cockroaches are going to be living. Well, this is the one that will be living. That being said, you might not want to spend your rarity on that particular card that is only used in one fun kind of deck. So instead, I want to look at how you can take a shell or a central idea of a deck and then tweak it. This is still the deck that wants to abuse drawing cards and getting cheap ramp. So you'll notice a lot of similar cards here. The card draw suite is exactly the same. Still have the Temple Scribe, still have the Twinning Ritual. Still indeed have the one-off crown of possibilities that you can put in for whatever you want. And then we have the Thunder Strike Dragon as well as the Twin Brew Sauropods. But what this is now going to do is to try and take advantage of the keyword right underneath the rarity of Dinosaur. Recently, we won an Abasaur Patriarch early on in the campaign and let's have a chance of putting it together. It means that our dinosaurs when it's in play cost less and it can make our dinosaurs bigger which is another way of taking advantage of us trying to swarm the board. So let's swarm the board with some more dinosaurs in the form of Teriax Hatchling um, as well as our nesting Abasaur conveniently happens to be a dinosaur. So rather than operating on the clockroaches we're going to the skies instead. Yeah. It's a downgrade, I'll be honest about that. And so as a result, we're throwing in a crystallize to try and help out and to get ourselves a little bit of evasion on these hatchlings. And I'm not quite as confident with this deck as I am with the clockroaches, but you can see how by with a small shift, you can change around a deck entirely. Uh, It'll be interesting to see how many Patriarchs we can get on the table at one point in time. And so yes, two similar style decks going head to head in this particular matchup. But I feel as though it's always useful uh, to explore different skills that are needed to be competitive in Eternal and really being able to look at someone's list and work out what the key ingredients are and then which ones are the element of flair. It's a useful skill. But let's start off with the primary deck here, our Clockroaches, and see how we go. Now it really helps to be on the play in this particular matchup because it means that if you happen to get some of your ramp cards you can use them cheaply we don't have any combination cards here we don't have any card draw and we don't have any echo cards so even though we have our colors i want to throw this back and see if i can start to get some cards that will allow me to start going off Now unfortunately being double time we won't be able to get away with playing these cheaply but we have all of the cards we need to start going nuts so long as we can draw our time that's the one bit that has me nervous with this hand. But if we can live long enough to do so we'll be fine. It's not the card we wanted for right now. And so now we just hope that we don't get too power screwed. at all. Okay, fortunately our opponent doesn't have us on too much of a clock and if we are able to draw into some of our power then we'll be okay. Uh, I think we want to put probably a Clockroach on top of our deck and we definitely want to draw. Unfortunately we couldn't do that first. Ideally I would have had the colors to cast a Twinning Ritual and make this a bigger Clockroach to put on top of my deck and to start to copy those there. But beggars can't be choosers. we have any cards in our yard? Oh, we have another Clockroach. Okay, so I made a mistake there. What I should have done was I should have played the Dark Return to bring this first and then played the Twinning Ritual on the already larger one. That's okay though. Uh, Once we get our second time, we'll be in a good position. What we could also think about doing is if we draw a second power that is not time, if we get to five, we can play the Dark Return on this Thunderstrike Dragon to bring it back. And then we'll be able to... Okay, so I have a problem here. Actually, these only cost... Yeah, we still don't have the, the faction to play it. 
What I'm going to do is I'm going to cast my Avasaur and put my Thunderstrike Dragon on top of my deck so that next turn when I draw two copies of it, at least I'll be able to cast some kind of creature. I just, like, ideally I'd prefer to be drawing my time. And this is guaranteeing that I'm going to be a whole turn away from doing so. But at least this way I can start to put some bodies on, on the table. <laughs> and we're going to have to do so very quickly, otherwise they're going to overrun us, especially if they can keep bouncing us with these Praxis Enforcers, Praxis Displacers. So the good news there was this was uh, permanently two cheaper thanks to the Nesting Avasaur then because I drew them on that turn, their total cost was only two. Although I fear that I'm going to get run over if I don't draw a time on this very turn. So let's see if we can get back and draw into what we need. Uh, as far as cards to discard, I think we'll discard a Clockroach. See if we can draw a time. That's not what we needed. Do we have any cards in here that we could bring back from the dead that are useful? We have a Thunderstrike Dragon. Unfortunately, if I'm to attack, they can't kill it, which is not helpful for us. So I think what we do is we Dark Return the Thunderstrike Dragon then we cast a Nesting Avasaur, putting the Thunderstrike Dragon on top, which means next turn we can cast two of them for two. We're still in Strife, but at least we keep developing our board. And <laughs> we have the world's biggest graveyard. Okay, so we cast our Nesting Avasaur, put the Thunderstrike Dragon on top, and we hope that we can live one more turn. Unfortunately, I think the, the power screw got us in trouble here. Ooh, we're in a lot more trouble. So if we block, we're taking 6, 9, 11, 13, we'll be on 4. I don't think we have enough to get out of this. Okay, so if that was a lie, we still would have been dead anyway. Okay, we got quite unlucky there. Let's give it another shot. You could get a sense of how our hand was getting out of control, if only we could find that second primal. Uh... No, I think we can send this one back too. It's a good hand if we had one extra. Source of color. It is the one catch of this Nesting Avasaur interaction, is that if you are in trouble uh, looking for your colors, well, this is going to be putting cards on the top of your deck. So again, we're just hoping to get that one extra time sigil. Excellent. Uh, it doesn't matter playing it right now because we can't actually get anything useful on board. And even though I'd like to have the shadow eventually, getting my second time is so much more important with all of these cards. So by playing our first cockroach, this cockroach in my hand and the other three that are in my deck all get plus one plus one. Next turn I'll be able to cast my nesting avasaur putting this clockroach back on top of my library and then we'll be able to really start to go off. You know what we can do even better than that so by casting twinning ritual I can make this clockroach more powerful and they're also cheaper. I can then cast my Nesting Avasaur to put this cheaper Cockroach back on top, which means I'll be drawing it again next turn. 
When I draw it next turn, they're going to be cheaper again because they've got the discount from being drawn. My opponent only has two more static bolts left. So we should be right now. So I have a choice. I think I actually want to keep one of these really cheap clockroaches in my hand in case I get another piece of fun interaction. Normally I'd prefer to use my power effectively though. These are cheap enough, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a Twin Brood and then play out my Clockroaches. And you'll notice as I play them, they all get bigger and more intimidating. This way, if I do happen to draw another power, I can cast both of my Clockroaches on this turn. And you have one more Static Ball. Uh, static bot left that I need to worry about. That's a very nice draw. <laughs> and you can see just how quickly this gets totally out of hand. Unfortunately, gaining one life a turn isn't going to do too much. <laughs> Swing in to force the jump blocks, and we'll have them dead next turn. Now one of the things I like to do when I'm in a dominant position like this is I'm no longer asking myself the question of how do I win, instead I'm asking myself the question of how do I lose. And so I need to be thinking through what my opponent could possibly have that could blow me out in a situation such as this. It's a bit of a moot point here. If they were playing green and I had to respect harsh rule, then I wouldn't be casting any of these cards in my hand because I'd like to have the opportunity to reload. The reality is that there's almost nothing as far as creatures that they'll be able to block this. And I know because they played... Oh no, they played their hunting second uh, Terex Hatchling. I thought that they still had one in their hand. So even though I could continue to develop out on the board here, there's really not a lot of point. Um, it's just taking an undue risk. I feel very comfortable that even if they can chump block the nine, they won't be able to block enough of these. Even with the massive discounts. <laughs> of course, in this moment, they proved me wrong by drawing the Clockroach. That's okay, though. Do I have a good one to bring back? I have a nesting Avasaur, which is a bit of fun. Or if one of these dies, I can bring him back with my Dark Return. Or I could just do the maths before attacking. <laughs> uh, fun and games. So yeah, sweet. You had the chance to see uh, just how disgusting Clockroaches can get when you build around them. Uh, let's take the opportunity to show you a similar shell, but this time with dinosaurs. Uh, and it just goes to show it's perfectly fine not to have to spend your shift stone, your hard-earned money on clockroaches if that's not the kind of deck that you think will be fun. 
Again, perfectly fine hand we're going to be able to ramp up. Because we're on the play, uh, unfortunately the double time hurts us again here. Uh, but even so, this will still be a perfectly fine hand. We'll be able to cast the Seed of Wisdom, allowing us to cast this for zero. Oh no, it doesn't get echoed. Uh, I've been spending way too long play testing all of these decks, so I'm tired before I even start recording, which is the perfect space to be. The one thing we need to find right now is our second time sigil though, so we can get all of these out. Hmm. Big shame we couldn't cast this this turn. Is there anything that we really want to Twinning Ritual right now? I guess in the long term we're going to be wanting to cast these Twin Broods, so... Let's do these and we'll just wait until we can get that second time sigil. She's helpful for ramping, but not what we need right now. This will be a little bit of a problem if we don't draw. Okay, that's a relief that we're able to draw our sigil here. I'm going to be playing my Patriarch this turn. Uh, the reason why is I want these to be cheaper for me. I'll be in a much better position once I can start to play these Twin Broods. That's a shame because it stops me jump blocking. Oh, sorry, blocking rather. But that's okay. We'll be able to cast these five health guys. Now if we attack, they're just going to blocks. So there's no point in doing it. And once we get enough dinosaurs down, we could even use the Lord ability here of paying 60 of my dinosaurs plus two plus two. So these guys, they're one cheaper because of the Patriarch's ability and then they're two cheaper because I drew them this turn. Basically it means that they're pure happiness. They won't be able to attack in quite yet, but once I can use my ultimate ability I'll be fine. Which makes me even half think about using Dark Return on the Initiative of the Sands, but the reality is I'm going to be able to draw myself some power sooner or later. I think I'm going to try and draw a power. Excellent. This way, next turn, I can use my ultimate, which will start to become a genuine problem. Kind of sweet in a way. Uh, for the first one, I love the fact that this is free. Uh, do we need any of our colors? No, we're sorted. This has worked out really well with this video series. It's allowed you to see uh, both. Both of the decks doing what they hope to do. Uh, I'd rather kill... Wait, which one's blocking him? I'd actually rather kill the Annoying Flyer. That opens up my hatchlings to be able to attack in. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to wait until next turn to cast my Dark Return. That'll allow me to cast these even cheaper. he get Echo? Is there something that I missed before? Ah, okay. He played Elysian Pathfinder. That makes sense. 
Let's take my free draw. And that's really useful for us because what it means is that when I draw these and they get too cheaper because I've drawn them this turn, I'll be able to afford to cast one as well as using the ultimate ability, which will then allow me to be able to attack him with these guys. Yeah, so as I was saying before I got distracted by what I had to do, it's kind of sweet to be able to show both how the clock roaches and also how the dino lord's able to work. Uh, you get more dinosaurs with winning this particular campaign. And so that one with its fate ability is a perfectly fine one to include as well. In fact, it's ideal for this because it keeps getting bigger and bigger. So it does the same thing as what Clockroaches does, where it gets larger the more times you can draw it. I don't know whether it's your cup of tea to go back and replay campaigns or not, but it's definitely a fun one. You get to do some janky janky stuff that normally you're under a little bit more pressure from your opponent for. So there you have it folks, that was the Collector's Horde on a budget with both Clockroaches and Elysian Dinosaurs. Enjoy your hibernating behemoths. <laughs> I've been Cozzy for Pick One Pack One. And thanks for watching this series with me. I'll see you guys in just a moment.